Welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Our co-hosts, Sri Rajagopalan and Peter V.S. Bond, explore how brands and retailers engage with consumers online, in-store, and everywhere in between. And now, here are Sri and Peter. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the CPG Guys podcast. I'm PVSB, one of the aforementioned CPG Guys. My domains of expertise revolve around the digital shelf and its content, retail, customer data, insights, CRM, and loyalty. My co-host, he's the other CPG guy, an expert in branding, direct-to-consumer, unified commerce, retail media, and marketplaces. Please join me in welcoming the man with one name, Shri. Shri, how are you doing today? Doing great, Peter. It's 55 degrees and sunny here in New York, which means it's time for spring training. I can't wait, and I hope you're doing awesome as well. Pleasure doing this week over week with you. Always a pleasure and nothing's better than pitchers and catchers moving into actually the first game of spring training. So very excited. Maybe the Yankees will do some this year. In any event, before we get to our guests, I want to remind our audience that all of our content, including our uh, fabulous series on profitability that Shri really spearheaded, uh, our Women's Leadership Series, our ongoing Founder Series in the first quarter of 2021, all of that can be found audio and video format, and documents that accompany that, cpgguys.com, that's cpgguys.com. And of course, because our uh, content on this podcast is audience-driven, we rely on your feedback to tell us what you want to hear more about. So the way you can do that most effectively is just go to ratethispodcast.com slash cpgguys. Go to the Apple platform, leave us a rating and a very important written review. That's how we learn. That's how we understand. That's how we prioritize on the podcast. And we really appreciate that direction that you give us. So let's get to today's guest. Uh, He's a famous environmental psychologist who authored a groundbreaking book, which I read a little over two decades ago. Uh, It's called Why We Buy. And he's written a couple of other books since then. But This particular book explores uh, our ever-evolving consumer culture that ultimately drives purchasing decisions. At the same time, for the last 34 years, he was the CEO of Envirocell, a research and consulting firm specializing in studying retail and service environments. And last year, he transitioned into a strategic advisor role at the firm. I can't tell you how excited Shri and I are uh, to have as our guest today, Paco Underhill. Paco, greetings. Welcome to the CBG Guys podcast. How are you doing today? Uh, Mr. Shree and Dr. Bond, thank you for having me here today. Here. We, are, we are very honored uh, indeed to have you here today. I know we've got some really exciting questions for you, but uh, to frame our audience out uh, an understanding of, your, of what you're doing, can you give us a little bit of an overview of, of the kind of work you've done at Envirocell? Let me just give you a, a, some background here. <clears throat> That'd be great. Um, I am by training an urban geographer, and I was part of the crew that used to go around and rewrite commercial zoning ordinances for different cities across the country. Mm-hmm. I'm six foot five inches tall, particularly when I take a yoga yoga class. But I have a problem, which is that I don't like heights. And one of my jobs as part of the crew that would rewrite commercial zoning ordinances is that I would have to go up to the roofs of buildings and install the camera equipment to look at the traffic on the streets below. I had my moment, Peter, of epiphany on the roof of a 60-story building in Seattle where there was a stiff wind blowing and I could feel the building rocking in the breeze. And I promised myself at that point that I would reinvent my profession because I never wanted to have to go to the roof of a skyscraper again and look down over the edge. A week later, I was standing in a bank in New York City, getting madder by the moment and realized that the same tools that I'd been using to look at how a city work, I could probably modify and be able to take in and look at how a store or a bank, or an airport, or a hospital, or a doctor's office, or a theater worked, and I'd never have to go to the roof of a skyscraper again. 
So I was able to modify some of the techniques that we had been using to go from measuring cars and buses and whatever to measuring people. I started knocking on doors and getting exposed to the world of commercial research, which coming from an academic background, I could remember somebody describing a focus group to me and I was completely incredulous. I had the same reaction to it as somebody telling me what a Tupperware party was. I couldn't, but um, I started knocking on, knock, knocking on doors and saying, this is what I can do. Can I do it for you? And it took a while to be able to get that series of doors open. But part of what I realized as a nascent commercial researcher is that if you could come in and start winning victories for people and winning victories pretty quickly, there was no shortage to the work and the interest that would follow up. And part of what I always believed in as a researcher is that I would want to come back to my client with something they could do in two weeks, something they could do in two months, and something they should plan on doing next year. And if I could win some easy, quick victories, getting them to buy in to the broader picture was reasonably easy. We started in the mid 1980s as a testing agency for prototype stores. And we started with telecoms, the first telecoms. And there are so many basic terms to modern retail and modern re research of the consumer that we birthed back then from conversion ratio to browsing coefficients to all of those stuff. And part of what we found is no sooner did we start to win victories than somebody would move from that telecom job to a bookstore to a whatever. And I would know in the first 25 calls they would do, I would be one of them because they'd want us to start winning victories. That said, once we started, if you think of the Fortune 50 list, at some point or other, we have worked for more than half of them. We went from working on stores to going, somebody coming and said, well, could you take the same techniques and shrink them and look at the pet food section? And 10 years before the term category management was even invented, we were doing the first category management work. And part of what we realized stepping off into that world of commercial research is that at that point in the 1980s, there were two tools people used. First was the tools of media research, where I can ask you a question, okay? And I can do it on the phone, I can do it in a focus group, I can do it in a survey, I can do it subsequently online. But what I knew as an environmental psychologist is what people say they do and what people actually do are often different. And then the second tool that people use is sales research. And it is very important to understand where you're winning. And whether it's done through a register or it's done through click streams online, all of that positive information is, is critical. But I also know that understanding where you're losing is one of the ways that you get to easy and quick victories. So part of what we started doing is to find ways to watch. And what we also recognize that in the broader world of research, that if we used a variety of different techniques, and it may have started with observation, then it may have added an interview, then we may go into somebody's home and ask them to take us through their refrigerator or their uh, bathroom cabinets. It may be mobile eye tracking. But part of what I think is really interesting for us moving into the 21st century is that we are desperately looking for a better mix of art and science. That whether we think about marketing or whether we think about packaging design or we think about store design, or what is critical today is thinking about web design and online experience, that how do we adjust to a series of different critical factors? And those are all ones that all of us, you're working on it, Peter, Shree's working on it, and we've been working on it for 35 years. 
That's terrific, Paco. Thank you. And I'll just say before we get to the questions that as someone who's six foot four and similarly afraid of heights, it was the summer of uh, 1985 on Lake Ontario when assigned to a brigantine and asked to climb up the mast and go out the yard arm to hoist up the sail. I decided that pursuing a career sailing in the America's Cup was not for me. But in any event, let's get to the questions. Thank you, Paco. Um, your book, Why We Buy, was published over two decades ago and yet remains to this day in publication across 26 or 28 languages and to the tune of about 100,000 copies a year. I'd sure love to know what is, in your opinion, kind of the timeless constants of, his con of the content in that book that keeps people wanting to buy it and learn from it. Okay. I think that's, that's, a, that, that's a very nice softball that you best pitched me here. Okay. In the summer of 1996, we had just moved offices and I had a slight bushy haired guy came knocking on my door and said, I'm a science writer, a Canadian science science writer. And I've been working for the Washington Post and I just moved to New York City and I have an assignment from the New Yorker magazine. And they said, maybe I should come talk to you. And I wondered about it. He kept coming back. And uh, the piece that he wrote, which was called The Science of Shopping, became one of the most reprinted pieces in New Yorker history. And up to that point, I'd been writing articles for various magazines and been struggling to find a publisher. But in the lee of that piece, I had agents knocking on my door going, can I represent you? And as I sat back and stared up at the ceiling, I went, maybe what I should write about is the biological constants. Because I recognize in the broader world of retail that retail is the dipstick of social change. That I knew even in 1996 that what made a good store in 1986 versus 96 was a reflection of the changes in us. And part of what Why We Buy the Science of Shopping focuses on is what are the things that stay the same? 90% of us are right-handed. Our eyes age in the same way. We move in certain clusters. We love our children. Hopefully we like our spouses. And I also recognized that having published short stories and other fiction pieces up until that point, that if I told the book, not trying to say, this is how smart I am, something that was enjoyable to read, that I would get an audience. And that's, and that's been my system now for 25 or 24 years as a quote unquote business writer, which is that I write business books, but I write business books for a popular audience. Do you know what the largest market for why we buy last year was? Simplified character Chinese. Actually, okay. um, uh, simplified character Chinese. And, and the it is popular in in China, it's popular in Brazil, it's popular in the emerging markets. And the 28th language that Why We Buy is in is actually a pirated edition in Farsi. I'm actually not surprised by what you said. I am curious to know what simplified Chinese is though. Simplified character Chinese, there are, there are two uh, Chinese languages. One is anchored in Taiwan, which is what they call complex character. And there's a, another version which was pioneered by the People's Republic, which is a simplified, easier to learn version and uses a smaller set of characters. So I have a publisher in, in Taipei, but I also have a publisher in Beijing. And you know, you mentioned China and that's actually a great segue to our next question which is here in the United States, we tend to be fairly insular in many things that we do. Retail innovation is certainly not very different from that as well, you know, because we have a fairly large population we're separated by water and, geog and geographical constraints, which keep us fairly isolated. But what's your opinion, Paco, with the world experience that you have working with clients every day? 
are we the center of retail innovation? If not, who is and what sort of retail innovations are you seeing these days? All right, Shri. First of all, I, I, I can say with some assurity that I don't have an opinion. I can report facts, okay? That we as a company uh, have worked in 47 countries across the world. And uh, even out of our New York office, over the past seven or eight years, more than a third of our work is done in China and Asia, okay? Part of what we know is, and I want to describe it as a story, Sheree, that if I'm on the corner of, of Lexington Avenue and 59th Street, and I'm watching two women walk into Bloomingdale's, and one of them looks to be 25 or, or 30, and the other one looks to be 55 or 60, which one has more money? The answer is unequivocally, whether I'm in New York or in London, the overwhelming majority of, of our wealth is in the hands of people who are 55 and over. If I'm in Dubai or I'm in Shanghai and I look at that same formula of a 30-year-old or a 60-year-old walking in the door, I can with some assurity tell you that the chances are good that the 30-year-old has more money than the 60-year-old, okay? So part of what is interesting is that retail innovation for all practical purposes, whether it's in retail or in shopping malls, probably left North America and Western Europe 25, maybe 30, 30 years ago. If I wanna to point to where the cutting edge is, the cutting edge is in places in the world where money is young. And whether that's, it could be in Shanghai, it could be in Singapore, it could be in Dubai, could be in Sao Paulo, even could be in Mexico City. If you ask me, what are the most impressive supermarkets I've ever seen in the world? I would have to tell you, um, Mexico City is just awesome as a place to go look at it. And even their category management processes here I think are a step or two beyond what we've been doing here in North, uh, North America. So uh, one of the programs which has been very, very helpful and I've done for audiences is what can we learn from emerging markets? And whether that's about how do I do a progressive shopping mall or how do I do a progressive um, uh, super, super, super market. Now, one interesting little note here is that often someone says, well, what about the digital world? What about the digital world? And I'm going, the most sophisticated digital market on the face of the planet is South Korea. And there are things that happen in Seoul that they do online that are um, years ahead of what we are doing now. I think what, what it is, is that the world has gotten a lot smaller. And one of the keys to uh, us in North America, better understanding how we get to a more prosperous post-pandemic -pan world is to take some cues between what people are doing in other parts of our shrinking planet. Paco, if you walk into a, a physical store these days and you don't have a smartphone on you, you're in the absolute minority of, of people shopping in that store. So my question to you is, thinking about people having those devices and having access to information, uh, even that or online, how do, how do you, in your opinion, has that fundamentally changed the retail shopping experience? Well, part of what we know, Peter, is that there is no more divide between the physical and the cyber world, that we are looking at some union. And you are absolutely right, that whether I'm shopping for, for groceries or I'm pumping gas, the number of people with a phone in their hand, and maybe they're talking to their daughters, maybe they're talking to their wives, maybe they're, they're doing something else online, but we are a multitasking people at this point. And one of the very interesting questions for our branding and merchant community is how can I use that information? 
How can I leverage that in a way? So let me just give you an example. The average time spent in a dressing room, and this is pre-pandemic. -pan it may have been more accelerated now. The average time spent in a dressing room is up anywhere from 10 to 20%. And somebody goes, why? Well, because that person, often under age 40, is using Snapchat and FaceTime to be able to go talk to her friends and go, do you like what I have on? And part of what we've done here, and this was started with our work in Brazil, is can we stage a dressing room so that when somebody uses a Snapchat or whatever, that there's something in the background that tells them where they are and starts a guerrilla marketing exercise that comes up from the floor. I might also say that we also know in a post-pandemic world um, that there are more men doing the family grocery shopping than there were. And they're often walking into the store completely clueless. And that part of their uses of the phone is going, did you want powdered turmeric or did you want no, no, is what, what does the real turmeric look like? I mean, stuff like that, which is all, these are vocabulary lessons. And whether I'm selling food or whether I'm selling laundry soap, that there is a way of being able to understand what that process is. Now, Peter, the other thing, which is very real here, and this is particularly for those of us here in North, uh, North uh, America, is that once we hit age 40, roughly 80% of our weekly purchases are the same thing. Meaning that you've decided on the kind of mustard, you've decided on the kind of milk, you've decided on the flavor of kefir. And one of the key aspects to it here is that, yes, I do want to go to the store. I want to pick out the, the meat, I want to pick out the tomatoes, I want to do it. But there's another piece of my shopping list here, which for all practical purposes, either I could simply have my kitchen order for me, or I could be on a subscription basis. And that that, that union here is one that liberates us. It liberates us as brands. Because it means that if somebody has already made their commitment I can deliver that to them in a way, in a package or a form that isn't designed for screaming on the shelf, but is designed to fit discreetly and elegantly into, into my kitchen. We are on the edge of a shopping, packaging, and marketing revolution, which is exciting. Let's, um, you mentioned we're on the edge of a shopping revolution packaging, marketing, perhaps even branding. So I'd like to hit up private, I'd like to hit up private label. Private label has obviously been around for quite some time in North America, but steadily and slowly gaining only minor traction year over year. I'd love to get your yeah. fact-based learning. Okay. Private labels in North America, are they attractive? Is it a slow ramp up or now post COVID are we gonna see something else? Well, part of what we have to recognize here is that the growth of private label in Western Europe, in Britain, and particularly in Canada has, has, has been much more advanced than it has been here. And we can look to examples at Carrefour, at Sainsbury, uh, at Tesco, and be able to be, cherry pick some, some things from it. So Shri, you know that when private label was first launched in the early 1990s, here in the US, it was generic white packaging. And there was almost a certain shame of pushing your shopping cart up to the register and having it uh, filled with those white generic boxes because it was almost a confession of poverty, okay? Part of what we know now is in 2020, 21, if you read Consumer Reports magazine, um, many of the private label products, whether they're from Costco or they're from Walmart, if you look at many of the staples of laundry soap and others, they rate really well. 
And the actual cost to it is such that there's a certain almost degree of pride when you go up to the register at Costco and there's all of those Kirkland products in it mixed in with all of that really expensive meats and other things because it shows that you're spending your money smartly. And I think that the private label movement here is one that's going to end up pushing some of the brands to rethink how they go to market and how they interact directly with the consumer. So let me just give you an example. If I'm Procter and Gamble and I'm selling Tide, okay, I can go to the consumer and go, I would like you to fill out this survey about what your washing machine is. Is it a top loader? Is it a front loader? How often do you use it? How how active are you about separating whites, colors, and whatever? Do you wash in cold water? Do you wash in warm water? Um, do you wash diapers or other things that are really dirty? And can you send us a water sample? Okay. And Procter & Gamble comes back to you and goes, Mr. Shree, they're on 59th Street and 10th Avenue in that building that you live in. Your water is a little hard. I am going to custom blend a laundry soap for you, okay? And we're going to send it to you in a recyclable package. And if you like it, you will have a fixed plastic jug with our name on the side of an elegant that fits into your laundry room. And on a subscription basis, we will send you in a recyclable plastic bag your custom brewed laundry soap for your washing machine, your water, and the way you do it. Don't you think that makes sense? I do too. And I, I think part of what we're watching here is that is that war or that between brands and stores. And while even in my own home, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge purchaser of Kirkland products. I also do a lot of buying at the farmer's market. So I have a certain bunch of stuff which is very global and is often very specific. And then I have a bunch of stuff that I'm trying to make as local as I possibly can. Doesn't that make sense, Shereen? Yeah. Hey, hey, Paco, um, before I ask the next question, I'll just make a general comment. And it begs back to my question on the access to information. You know, the single biggest driver of conversion from national brands to private label is uh, actually positive customer reviews because it gets to the heart of the issue with private label, which is quality. Uh, the more retailers start to collect reviews from consumers of their private label products, the faster they're going to start stealing business from national brands. And that's something that national brands have to pay attention to. But in any event, um, talking about technology, let's shift to the smart home. I think about Samsung refrigerators that have the ability to order products, can even order it automatically, and voice OS. You know, what do you think about those particular types of technological innovations on both purchasing behavior and the efficiency of the contribution to your, your overall time allocation during the day? Okay, well, Peter, do you know that I did two global, global tours for Samsung talking about the internet of things? And you know, customizing that that concept of the smart refrigerator, with you know, how does it fit into the Russian world? How's it fit to the Middle Eastern world? How's it fit to the African world? How's it fit to the Latino world? So I I think one of the things to be very cognizant of here is that we have the tools, but we have to find ways to understand the way those tools fit into the consuming patterns and the patterns by which people live in different parts of the world. So I'm a big advocate here of the smart kitchen and it's a step beyond Alexi or whatever, but it is not only is it the smart refrigerator, but it's the smart kitchen and kitchen cabinet. It's the smart garbage can. Those are all things that can contribute to a more progressive management 
of our homes and our purchasing patterns, but also what is really important, Peter, to understand is that they help get us greener on a family by family basis because it eliminates waste and it, it helps us be able to manage packaging. And that is the subject of my new book here, which has been submitted to Simon and & Schuster and I hope is out by the end of this year. Speaking of new book, good luck, by the way. We look forward to actually picking up a copy and reading it. Uh, but this very conversation we just had based on Peter's question of voice OS and uh, uh, the internet of things and smart devices in your kitchen, AKA smart kitchen. I'd love to move the conversation slightly to big data and technology. At the end of the day, okay. all, of these, all of these items, the internet of things is producing a lot of data. You even referred to guerrilla marketing earlier based on consumer behavior. You gave the example of the dressing room. Yeah. there. I'd love to get your opinion or your learnings on big data and technology. And are they really coming together and enabling customization across the consumer journey? Okay, I Shree, I think you have asked a, an extremely poignant, poignant question for our, for our time. And part of what the, our challenge is, is, is that big, big data often piles up data, you know, and it isn't the size of your pile that matters. It is what can you do with it? Okay. And let's remember, and this is something when I stepped off from the world of aca academia into the commercial research world, one of the things that I brought with me is I am not necessarily looking for statistical relevance. What I'm looking for is I want to collect as much data as I need to be able to get my processing engine to work so that I can get to the next step along the way, which is earning victories. And I think this has been one of the challenges that big data has had. That said, I can go back and look at the research that we were doing 25 years ago. And that if I think of the 40 basic data data points that we would generate in a typical prototype store test, more than half of them now can be generated digitally. That we can use AI in a variety of different ways to lower the, to lower the cost, particularly lower the travel to be able to get to places. But we still need to be very focused on what is the purpose. The, the purpose is to win victories for our client. And in that, re, in that regard, I've been very frust frustrated working with pieces of the AI community who are experts in collecting and have no idea how to process. And that I think the transition that many of us are having is getting out of the data collecting business and getting into the processing engine business. And, you know, over the past certainly 18 or 18 months, we have been dealing with a number of very major AI companies and trying to find ways of being able to, to merge that meeting of art and science. And the processing engine is a mixture of art and science. It's based on previous knowledge. It's based on some uh, history. Um, and it's based on some basic knowledge about human analog be behavior and how it is affected by a digital world. Paco, my, my final question for you today is related to the work you've done at Enviracell. You clearly spent an enormous amount of time observing consumer behavior to draw meaningful insights. And in this digital age where, as we mentioned earlier, big data is more easily processed, there's a tendency to think, well, I can just look at shopping behavior through the lens of what they buy. Uh, why in your estimation is the skill of observing consumer behavior still highly uh, relevant in the digital age? I think, you know, Peter, 
I can go back to one of the lines that I used in our opening conversation, which is that if I can start a research and design project and be able to go, I can look at what you have now and in two weeks, be able to help you win some small, easy victories, okay? That is very real. And part of what it does in the context of both branding and in retail is start to generate consensus. That second piece to the puzzle here is, under, is understanding both at retail and both in whether it's physical retail or digital retail, the easiest thing to change is the physical de design. The hardest thing to change is the operating culture. And part of what we have to do moving forward is to be eminently more holistic in terms of how we understand both the product, the shopping process, the supply chain, and localization. So if I think of the great state of Texas, the way someone shops in Austin and the way someone shops in El Paso is different, okay? And it doesn't mean that we have an infinite set of buckets, but it, but it does mean that we can design buckets, eight of them, where a, a large part of that processing gets to. We, we want in the broader research and consumer packaged goods community to be able to lower our costs, higher our impact, and shrink our timelines. And that's what technology should be able to help us do. So Paco, as I think through you know, be consumer behavior, and um, our final question for today goes in the direction of what's obviously transpired, which is a global pandemic. Do you see any emerging observable changed consumer behavior when it comes to brands and products and retail and things of that nature? Or do you feel, you know, once we settle back in what is obviously going to be a new norm for all of us, many of the existing behaviors will fade away and we'll see some of the old behaviors come back? Well, certainly, first of all, there will be the bio biological constants that stay the same. The way we see, uh, the way our eyes work at 25 and at 50 and at 60 haven't, haven't changed by a pandemic. I think what we're seeing is, first of all, a disparity from them who have and them who have not. And that there's a segment of our pop pop population that is going to weather the pandemic just fine. Stock market is up, real estate values are up, whatever. We have another segment of our market that is deeply distressed. We also know that there's a level of anxiety there. Do you know, for example, the, the number of people walking into a telecom store that are angry? Because their digital access has somehow been threatened and they've been unable to solve the problem online. They've been unable to solve it over the phone. I'm tired of screaming at Citibank about Citibank online when I try to solve problems there that I'm struggling with. And I've been an online customer for almost 30 years. Here is our, here is our point here, that in a post-pandemic -pan world, first of all, we have to be aware of the changing status of information. Digital literacy issues are a real challenge. Second is that one of the things that I, I am angry about, whether it's our social process, our political process, is recognize what the impact of a post-pan world has been on working mothers. That they're trying to look after their kids, they're trying to look after their homes, they're trying to look after their husbands, they're trying to look after our jobs and shame on us for not having paid better attention to it. Third is understanding time. That all of us in a multitasking world are desperate to find ways, not so much to save money, but to manage our time. The fourth one is what is local and what is global. And then the fifth one here, Shri, is 
understanding that the overwhelming majority of global wealth today is now in the hands of people who earned it in the course of their own lifetimes. That if I look at the 19 richest people on the face of the earth here, and whether I'm talking about Carlos Slim or Murkesh Ambani or somebody here in the US, that often in order to sell, we also have to educate. And I think this is a wonderful and creative challenge for our retail and our branding community is why does this t-shirt at H&M cost three bucks and this t-shirt at Macy's or at Selfridges cost 24 bucks or the equivalent. That's what our challenge is because ultimately one of the things that's going to happen is that we're going to have to get to fewer and better things. Shri and Peter, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. And if there's some follow-up or questions that are generated, please feel free to forward them to me. And for all your listeners out there, it is PacoUnderHill.com. Paco, thank you so much. I, I want to remind our audience that they can find all of our content at cpgguys.com. And please give us your feedback at ratethispodcast.com slash cpgguys. Paco, outstanding conversation, very thoughtful. Greatly appreciate you making time to do so. Can't wait for this crazy pandemic to end so I can make my way a couple towns over and maybe grab a cup of coffee uh, at one of the little coffee shops in Madison or, or Guilford. So thank you very much. Or come hang out by my pool with your Oh, kids. even better. Oh, Shri and I, Shri, Shri, we're going to get our big inflatable uh, ring toys with the duck heads and stuff. We're just going to jump in. It's going to be very- One of them may even say CPG guys on it. Yeah, I think we need to get some CPG guys pool swag. But anyhow, Shri, this is a great conversation. Thanks so much for joining me again okay. today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Paco, you. Guys. Thank you for coming on board. Shri. Peter, thank you as always. All right. All right, guys. And with that, I'll say thank you for joining us. And we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of the CBG Guys podcast. Goodbye. <laughs>